time. So um, let me say a few words about her. So Jessica Flack is a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. She's also the director of, um, collective of the Collect Collective Computation Group. Um, she did her PhD uh, in 2003, uh, received it from Emory, uh, studying cognitive science, animal behavior, and ev evolutionary theory. Her research focuses on uh, collective computation and its role in the emergence of robust structure and function in nature and society. And I see you have already shared a screen. Um, yeah, if you're ready, then you can just go ahead. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers. Uh, I think you guys have done a great job of getting really interesting questions on the table. So I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, and um, secondly, and say that I'm a bit sick, I'm much better than I was yesterday, but um, I'm a bit congested. So please just bear with me. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do today is really go over four concepts that my collaborators and I have been developing, trying to formalize in biological systems to understand computation. I've got them here in the title slide, coarse grain and collective computation, hourglass emergence and channel switching. So the, the talk is really just an overview of these four concepts, a very coarse overview. Now here on the title slide, we have a composite image of the physicist, John Wheeler. And he's, a, as you probably know, inventor of the phrase it from bit. And in the slide, he's at a Princeton blackboard and he's discussing what in nature can be quantized, but as if you were looking at, I made this image, as if you were looking at Walton Ford's a painter, a painting called Falling Bow. And I love that painting because it's a really fantastic depiction of collective behavior. And both um, Wheeler and the flock are overlaid on a circuit. So the composite image captures the central theme of today's talk, which is how the components of biological systems coarse grain, and that is how they estimate the state of the environment collectively and how these coarse grainings, when they're combined, collectively compute a solution, a phenotype or an output, if you like, that is appropriate, hopefully, given the state of the environment. And what I've just said essentially summarizes what to me computation in nature is fundamentally about, converting information in the environment to work largely by way of producing ordered states, by way of entropy production and minimization, now it's worth acknowledging at the start of the talk some, some of my positions and biases or assumptions. So the first is that the frameworks that we have for computation in biology and computer science are in some sense, the ones we have at present are in some sense either system dependent. So, you know, the result of working entirely in neuroscience or molecular biology, or they are mechanism agnostic. And that largely applies to the computer science frameworks. Another uh, assumption I make is that to discover the foundations of computation, which is fundamentally what I'm interested in, we need to approach the problem of computation, not just from the mathematical and theoretical computer science perspectives, but also inductively, and that's really what the talks you're gonna see today in the talk, by studying how a variety of systems convert um, in information in the environment to work. Now, what these assumptions su suggest to you is, is that I am what might be called a computational Platonist, so I believe the foundations of computation are to be discovered, not invented. And along these lines, I subscribe to the idea that to build a theory of computation for bio biological systems and social systems, a formal language for computation needs to take seriously a couple of things. Biological mechanism, information processing principles, the universal collective property of biological systems, and thermodynamic constraints. I won't say really anything about the, the last today, but the others I'll touch on a bit. So. In this talk, I'm going to provide a kind of first motivation, a really big picture motivation for the approach my collaborators and I have been developing. And then I'm going to give a course overview of what we think the elements and architecture of biological computation are, you know, for a variety of different systems. Given our admittedly, and I mean this both in terms of my collaborators and I and everyone, the community, um, rudimentary understanding of information processing principles. And finally, I'll return to my um, computational Platonism point. So Returning to Wheeler, you know, now you can see more clearly the background in this photograph. And as I said, he's sort of lecturing at a, he's lecturing at a symposium for his 60th birthday at Princeton. And um, according to a Kip, a Kip Thorne obituary that was published 
about him when he died, the drawing depicts an explorer's quest to conquer the great unsolved problems in gravitational physics. And I'm starting with Wheeler because he proposed in the, in the paper that I've got on the slide titled Information Physics Quantum, the Search for Links, which is a paper, by the way, that he first presented at a Santa Fe Institute meeting back in 1989 before he'd written the paper as a talk. And he wrote in that paper, all things physical are information theoretic in origin. And, and this is a participatory universe. Observer participancy gives rise to information. He went on to write, it from bit, otherwise put, every it, every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself derives its function, its meaning, its very existence entirely, even if in some context indirectly, from the apparatus elicited answers to yes or no questions, binary choices. And later in the paper, he, he poses a central question, and I'd say it's a question that's sort of at the core of my research interests, a question, it's a question of collective computation, really. How does the vision of one world, or at least uh, uh, an overlapping vision of one world arise out of the information gathering activities of many observer participants. So he was, you know, he's working in physics on quantum stuff, but he's really doing collective intelligence. So implicit in this question is the idea that the macro scale arises from interactions at the micro scale and going further to understand the macro scale, we need to reference go down to the micro scale. Now, Conrad talked a lot about this and in the collective behavior world, as well as in neuroscience and in many other areas of biology, this view is often treated with suspicion. Uh, let me just go over some, some of the disagreements. So there's disagreement about how far down we need to go to predict and explain at the macro scale, a lot of disagreement. And I wanna suggest that this disagreement stems from variation across systems in the degree to which collectivity or screening off of macro from micro uh, is, is, is a property of those systems and a failure of the community to recognize that there's this diversity. So I'm saying there's, dis there's actually variation across biological systems and how screened off the macro scale is. And when it's screened off, we can predict and, and, and explain at the macro scale. And when it's not, we have to go down to the micro. So I'm gonna sort of provide a framework today for starting to think about how we can ask that question to know whether we're doing the right thing in our work. Now, um, I wanna to say too, that I think the burden is on all of us as a community that even if we show, even if we feel that our macro scale stuff is screened off, that we have to show that the, 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 the um, variables we're focusing on at the macro scale are, are not nominal, the result of observer bias, but actually fundamental, that they can be derived from the micro scale, even if we don't need to do that in our work to predict and explain, all right? So that is a kind of very physics-y point, and, I, and, I, and I'm a strong advocate of it, and I will argue it. Um, uh, that it's, re it's the responsible thing to do to show that they can be derived, even if we don't need them. Okay, I want to finally make this point that you'll see a distinction that's gonna come up a lot in this talk is between energetically constrained systems and systems that are have a lot of information processing additionally. And I want to suggest now at the start, just to sort of prime you to this issue, that in systems that are heavy on information processing, we have to be particularly careful about these issues. And that's because there's error and the system's point of view in those, in those systems is particularly important. So we have to sort of really understand the micro macro relationship and not assume it, assume we understand it in those systems because it's gonna, it's gonna involve observer dependency. Now, this debate's become more heated, this debate about how far down to go has become more heated in recent years because we have so much, increasingly so much micro scale data. And uh, Asif and John Krakauer and David Popple and others discussed this in a very sort of like widely circulated paper a couple of years ago, which I recommend you, you guys take a look at if you haven't. I think probably most people in this group have. So in that paper, they sort of address this question about all this data and you know how, what do we do with it and what's right to use and the, you know the impact of technology on measurement and so forth. But another question is how much of these data do, does nature actually use? Okay, how much of these data does nature use to make its estimates? Do biological systems use to make its estimates of how the, and its effective theories of how the world works? And as significantly, how does nature compress, right? Not how do we as physicists and biologists do optimal compression given the data we have, but how does nature do it? So those are my questions. And um, I have this, I have this um, paragraph from Laughlin and Pines and others middle way paper, which again, probably everybody knows, and I recommend you read it if you haven't, it's very interesting. I have this paper up here because uh, I want to understand, you know, are there essentially what they call macroscopic protectorates for biological systems? And let me just read you a little bit of this quote. 
So we say that superfluidity, ferromagnetism, and metallic conduction, hydrodynamics, and so forth are protected properties of matter. That means they're generic behavior that is reliably the same in one system to the next, regardless of the details. There are more sophisticated ways of articulating this idea, such as stable point renormalization group, but all boil down to descriptions of behavior that emerge spontaneously. Not all of this applies necessarily to biological systems, but I think the basic idea is interesting and does. And is stable against small perturbations of the underlying equations of motion. Now, um, let's see, let me skip down a bit. Um, okay, more is clearly different. But we can ask, is plenty nearly enough? One could debate whether the existence of protected behavior on the macroscopic level is fundamental truth because of quantum mechanics or historical accident. And I would add to that, or because of the way uh, components process information, errors and so forth, that's a little different from history. Um, so do we have the tools to discover protectorates? The fact that lane scales between atoms and small molecules on the one hand and macroscopic matter on the other is regular, which we cannot pr presently see and about which we therefore know very little. This state of affairs would not be of much concern if there was a desert of physical phenomena between the very large and the very small, but as we all know, there is life in the desert, okay? So again, it's the micro-macro relationship, and this slight frame shift is key to all I do in the stance I'm going to take in this workshop, which is that to make progress in the emergence and adaptive systems, we really need to start thinking from the system's point of view, and implicit in this question is several provisional information processing principles. First, that any time there's a perceiver, a la Wheeler, um, and to, to do uncertainty reduction, to get information, to do uncertainty reduction, there has to be processing or computation. And um, two, that information processing in biology is noisy and error prone, meaning that the path to entropy minimization and ordered state is not necessarily monotonic. They're, these are not optimality principles in a strict sense, but they're more like empirical or pragmatic principles. And I say that to distinguish, it's not, not just history dependence. Uh, I want to really emphasize that. So this all comes from, I think, the fact that the universe is participatory and that entropy is increasing, right? So we need that en en entropy minimization. So now to further motivate this frame shift I'm advocating, I want to consider the following, which is that, oops, I think I'm missing a slide. Um, which is that physics, you know, physics is dominated by concepts like pressure, temperature, and entropy. And these emerge through simple collective effects and provide deep insights into the, you know, organiza organization of the physical universe, and the behavior. Biology, on the other hand, to, and that includes society and ecology, makes use of comparable collective concepts, including um, metabolism, conflict management, robustness. But of course, in contrast to physics, these are functional properties. Now in physical systems, orders produce the minimization of energy, adaptive systems produce order through the minimization of energy and via, in many cases, information processing. It's not unique to biology, it happens in physics too, but in physical systems too, but it seems to be much be playing a much larger role in biology. So why information processing is so, is so um, central in adaptive systems and whether it makes them fundamentally subjective and uncharacterizable by laws, unamenable to prediction. These are big open questions that at, at SFI we work on and of course other, other places as well. Now, in trying to understand these questions, the relationship between micro and macro and how to predict the macro scale, the history of physics is informative. We don't wanna mimic it as you'll see my talks about how we're not gonna mimic it, um, but it's, it's informative. Um, in fact, I would say that much of the confusion that we suffer now was actually also suffered in physics. Um, so what I've got here is, in, um, is a slide that sort of just sums up this very crudely, this microscopic macroscopic relationship in physics. And I wanna make a couple of points, which is that in, his, in the physics history of the relationship between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, there are sort of three questions that come to the fore. The first is, do we observe predictable relationships among macroscopic variables? That's the first question that has to be asked. Like, you know, is there, are there statistical regularities at the macro scale? Are these macroscopic variables fundamental? This comes back to my nominal point at the beginning of the talk. Can they be derived from the micro? If not, they're observer bias. But if they can, then we're in a, then we're in a position to start to say that the relationship among the macroscopic variables are law-like. And we can start to describe the macroscopic state of the system. And ideal gas law is one example. And I recommend you read Hasak Chang, he's a philosopher physicist at Cambridge, book Inventing Temperature, which gives a really great sense of the complexity and confusion of this debate around temperature in physics, macroscopic variable. Um, I'll point out to you that you know, this debate plays been playing out in collective behavior, neuroscience, and social evolution. You may remember in the uh, early 2000s, there was a paper published by Christina 
Karina Tarnina, Martin Novak, and E.O. Wilson. And the, the main paper was sort of on kin selection and, it, and there's 130 person response to it. Forgetting the main paper and just focusing on the appendix, which is really nice, Tarnita and Martin were really making the point in the appendix that kin selection equation, which is very phenomenological, the variables in are not, they're nominal. They're not derived from first principles. And they spent the appendix showing how they could be derived from population structure more or less. And so I recommend you take a look at that. And it's still something that we fight about. It seems kind of obvious to me, but it's not necessarily obvious to the community. Okay, so, so what I wanna do now is give an example of how, of how this micro macro relationship, uh, relationship has been worked out in a, couple of, in a couple of examples in biology done well, essentially. And so what I have in mind is the work on scaling by Jeffrey West and Jim Brown and Brian Enquist, Louise Betancourt, Chris Kempis, Van Savage, and many others, um, all of whom are my colleagues. Um, and they, uh, they're, they, they're showing, they, or the example, the example I'm going to put on the table now serves two purposes. First, it illustrates that deriving macro from micro biology can be done, the practice of it, so to speak. But it's also going to um, illustrate why, one reason why understanding micro, how, how information processing changes our understanding of scaling and law-like regularities. So what we've got here are two slides showing, um, the elephant slide is mass and metabolic rate, showing how they scale. And there's a and there's sublinear scaling in the case of mass and metabolic rate, which is a very very energetically dominated um, system. And there's an economy of scale, so the scaling sublinear. The theory is well developed. Uh, they derived the scaling relationship, Kleiber's law, which is around for a long long time before they did their work from first principles. That's really their contribution. Um, they understand the micro macro relationship now. I would say for the most part, there's still some things to fight about, but but a lot of progress has been made there. Now on the, on the other slide, we've got scaling for um, social systems. And the one example I've got up there is city size. And I think it's like patent generation, crime, income, and so forth. And the main point there is the statistical regularity at the macro scale is super linear scaling. So increasing returns to scale, but the relationship is not derived from the micro yet. They're, they're doing that work now. And it's very hard, partly because the data have only started coming in um, much more recently than in the, in the metabolic case. But it's also perhaps more difficult because the, these systems are, have more information processing and collective effects. That's my, um, that's, my, that's my strong view on one of the reasons why this is so challenging. And um, I, really, I really want to emphasize that difference. So when you get information processing and collective effects, it looks like the scaling shifts from sublinear in the energy dominated cases to superlinear, increasing returns to scale. Okay, so why is this important? Well, I think what's going on in addition to these collective effects, right, is that there's error and heterogeneous decision-making in these systems. So it brings us back there, there are partly aligned interests, different windows on the world, components are at different de developmental stages. So that heterogeneity is sort of captured here in this slide, which uh, you can read, you know, they're out of equilibrium, comp components are turning over, but the system's sort of staying more or less the same. To some extent, there's a kind of effective equilibrium state derived by, from having multiple overlapping time scales and space scales. And you might look at this kind of thing and wonder about what I've been saying. You might think, well, given all this variability, it's amazing that there's ordered states at all. However, you know, I mean, noise sometimes plays an organizing role. We all know that. And as I said, um, maybe one way that these systems are achieving regularities by building multiple time and space scales, and those are essentially creating effective equilibrium states. So if we back out a little bit, what I'm suggesting is that components are collectively computing their macroscopic worlds in these information processing systems. They're creating hierarchy of time and space scales and using the slower scales time scales as a background, uncertainty minimization, prediction essentially. But to understand where these time and space scales come from, how they arise, we need to take into account that system's point of view. Now, this is sort of captured um, by the writer and painter, uh, Leonardo, Leonardo Carrington, uh, who, and I can't stand these little um, Zoom boxes that, that overlap on my quotes. She, she wrote, to possess a telescope without its other essential half, the microscope, seems to me a symbol of the darkest incomprehension. Basically, we need to 
you know, peer into the telescope and the microscope in order to really understand what's going on. I just think that's just such a nice um, quote, given the points I'm trying to make. So to reiterate that a little bit more, you know, consider the fact that life is hierarchically organized. As we know, the human body, for example, has 30 trillion bacterial cells, 30 trillion self cells, 86 billion of these are neural cells or hundred billion now. There's 8.6 million people in New York City. There's this just this incredible hierarchy. And the lower scales, which we often seem to be simpler and we get more complexity going up, turning out not to be simpler. So the Russian doll sense might be the only sense in which complexity increases as we move up scales. And you know, this illustration from smart biology of, of what a cell actually is, a neuron in this case, I think is makes this point really clearly. So we all carry around in our heads the idea that a cell is kind of like a blob with 10 organelles, a blob of cytoplasm with 10 organelles floating about, but that's just, just not the case. The microscale is incredibly complicated. And, um, and it's not just, you know, it's not just, it's prokaryotes too are much more complicated than we thought. So biology is replete with rich empirical descriptions of microscale complexity from, for a wide range of systems from the molecular to the social. And I think we need to start taking this complexity into account. In another talk, I would tell you about how complexity begets complexity. I'll touch on that a little bit when I get to hourglass emergence. Um, but so um, Jessica, just a small reminder. Um, you have uh, like three minutes left or so, three, four oh minutes. God, I don't three minutes yeah, left. Just, All right. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so a natural question is to ask how nature overcomes subjectivity during information processing. And our proposal is that adaptive systems over, overcome complexity overcome subjectivity by collectively coarse graining and collectively computing solutions to an uh, EVO or learning time. And I won't say much about coarse graining since I don't have any time left. I, I normally would tell you what it actually is because the technical definition matters here, but I'll just say that coarse graining is lossy but true compression. That means um, it's, a, it's a simplification, but it doesn't introduce any details that aren't actually present in the system. Okay, Walter, uh, we call this, when the coarse grain is done by the system itself, we call it endogenous coarse grain. And Walter Fontana, we developed this idea over many conversations at Tea in the Kitchen. Walter was part of that. He calls it internal coarse grading. I recommend you check out his paper on molecular coarse grain if you want to understand that. So elements of computation for us are here, input, output, circuit, algorithm, and a notion of correctness, um, which you can get through separation of time scales. And as I said before, the slower variables um, provide the background against which the system tunes. Um, we think about this in terms of circuits. We get the circuits, the causality to, get, to go back to, to Conrad, and I totally agree with his definition of causality interventionist. I would just add that it's a hierarchical concept. And so, you know, as you get more mechanistic, there's still causality, but you get more, more specific, closer, more proximal, I'd say. So uh, we use what we call inductive game theory to get causality out of time series data and build circuits like these that describe the microscopic configuration of the system. We then reduce these circuits, that we compress these circuits using biologically principled dimension reduction, meaning trying to take into account the system's point of view about how it's processing the information in the circuits. I won't go through this for a lack of time, but what we get out of this is the architecture of collective computation that we think quite applies quite broadly. And uh, just to explain quickly, this schematic is unfolded in time. The Ws are the states of the environment. Uh, there's an algorithm P that the X is used to coarse grain the states of the environment into their opinions or effective theories for how the world works. There's some circuit or um, uh, uh, causal graph that describes the interactions among the Xs. Then the Xs collectively compute, that's an algorithm A, to produce macroscopic variables Y. The Ys then feed back to the Xs to change the cost landscape, for example, producing new behavior disease in the Xs or a new environmental states. And the B is the algorithm that describes that process. Okay, so uh, there are many ways to, um, this is just a, a small point that we can come back to in the discussion. There's many ways to represent how all of this works and there's no single way to do it. So this is a, a nice slide from a, a paper by Peter Stadler and David Krakauer and Sonia, uh, in which they make this point. And I just wanna add to it that we need to combine, to do this well, we need to combine probabilistic and um, com computer science deterministic approaches, I think. And we're really nowhere near doing that in a way that's not kind of inelegant and kludgy. We've done it in sort of inelegant ways. Finally, I'll say um, this, what we think this uh, happens sometimes in these systems with this collective coarse graining and uh, coarse graining by individuals is uh, 
what we call information bottlenecks. It's a term also used by Tishby and Bialik and others in a similar way, but they mean it in specific machine learning sense. This information bottleneck comes from the course graining. It, it allows the system to build effective theories for how the world works. The effective theory might be wrong, but it uh, allows the system to gain hypotheses for, for what the right behavior is and produces what we call a macroscopic expansion. So under some cases, the course graining, the bottleneck, by redirecting or allocating attention to, to, to more, appro more appropriately allows for new behavior to emerge. That's the macroscopic expansion. And I've got that sort of here illustrated with this, these hourglass, this hourglass framework. So just to reiterate, hourglass emergence, endogenous coarse graining creates an information bottleneck, leading in some cases to innovation and this macroscopic expansion. Now, um, to come back to my um, earlier points about how far down do we need to go and screening off, I think by understanding this collective computation through this collective computation approach, what the micro macro relationship actually is, we are in a position to st start asking how screened off the macro is from the micro. And what I want to suggest is that to formalize, there's a transition in information flow. So I said there's diversity across biological systems and how screened off they are. So um, some systems are very screened off, the macro scale is sufficient, some systems we have to go down to the micro scale to do the prediction and explanation. And I think what this reflects is this information transition. So we go from a case where there's information flow between micro and macro to one where there's very little flow between micro and macro, and it's mostly between macro and macro. And, and I've got sorry. all that summarized here. Jessica, I need to wrap up. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. So this is these are my last, these are my last slides. So I'll just say. Statistical evidence for law-like relationships among a set of macroscopic variables. Macroscopic variables need to be fundamental, not nominal. When there's, um, when there's the degree of information flow between micro and macro is small, we have screening off. We need to ask how sensitive, though, the, ma the macro is to microscopic perturbations and whether macro-macro prediction is improved with micro-info. And I have a nice example um, from James O'Dwyer and Mario Moscarello, which I won't go through, but we can in the discussion if you like to sort of illustrate a proof of principle. So, just to, to end, I'm proposing that these conditions that I've got here on this slide capture the degree to which the um, macro scale is essentially an effective termination criterion for the micro scale, uncertainty minimizing, so the micro scale can tune, um, tune interactions uh, using the macro scale information. All right, I can stop there. All right, thanks a lot, Jessica. This um, was a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Uh, uh, very, very dense presentation, a lot in there. Um, so we have one question from the Q&A. Um, the question is, isn't it interesting to understand coarse graining as a spectrum from many, uh, in brackets, smaller scales to uh, many, in brackets, larger scales? Uh, this might help get around choosing scales. Um, this would also mean there are uh, there may be multiple phase transitions. Uh, I can I can read this again if this That's was okay. too much. Yeah, I think you got the gist of it. So yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, in another talk, and uh, I I would go, I would make the connection um, maybe to renormalization group theory in physics. So basically, you know, you can think about renormalization group and coarse graining as the way that the micro the very small connects to the very large. It's kind of a rigorous way of connecting the very small to the very large. And that's kind of the goal here too, but instead of thinking about this from the kind of physics perspective of how you do coarse graining, the idea is to figure out how the biological components are doing the coarse grainings and how those coarse grainings combine to, to map the micro to macro and that renormalization group sense. So yes, I think that that's right. Um, you know, the only, the only real difference is, is it's not, it's not necessarily the case, the course grainings that physicists would apply or those doing, you know, um, are looking for optimal course grainings would apply to the system are the, are the ones that we want here. We want to figure out how the components are making those estimates and how the estimates are combining rightly or wrongly to given the information in the environment to produce the macro scale. So when I said the macro scale is collectively computed, it might not have high mutual information with the environment because of error and in information. Uh, in information processing. However, it also may recover environmental regularities through the collective aspect. That's that's sort of the, um, the, the two points mm -hmm. with respect to okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I will 
maybe ask very quickly a question as well, and maybe you can just very briefly answer it um, for the sake of time. So I was uh, wondering um, how uh, figuring out micro to macro relationships is affected by the problems that the Conrad has been also talking about. So omit omitting variables is one problem, also the uh, the impossibility of recovering um, the the underlying causality if the systems are too big, and I guess um, because we want uh, macro variables to be caused by micro variables, we we do deal with problems of causality um, as well. So so how would you how would you see the relation between uh, yeah my, micro macro relationships and the the general problems and causality? Well, the, so because of this. It's all com com uh, made even more complicated by this information processing point I keep making and the error mm -hmm. that seems to be inherent in that. Now, back up and say one thing, which is that there is an agreement uh, in biology yet about whether information processing is optimal or not. You will see for some simple systems, it seems to me the information processing is optimal and error is, is not really a problem. But of course, those systems could have evolved you know, and solved the problem. Um, alternatively, they're just simple enough so that error is not really an issue, but there is disagreement about how error prone biological systems are and that comes up in economics in another way which we could talk about in the panel discussion that, that's that's relevant here too. Um, but the, the micro macro thing in order to get the causality in the map, you have to tight, I think you have to titrate so you start with a hypothetical, you know, hypothesized correct input based on independent information. And you start with hopefully some statistical regularities at the macro scale that you observe, but you don't know whether they're fundamental yet or the, or just nominal. And then you 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 have to titrate inductively, go back and forth to get the causality and the mechanism or the more refined. I think a mechanism is just more fine grained causality essentially. So even in Pearl's framework, there's like the, you know there is a hierarchy of causality. And so the the question is is comes back to that screening off question: How much of the fine grained mechanism is required given your questions given the you know the the scale at which you're working so mm -hmm. and i think the burden is on us to show first that our, if we're going to rely at the macro scale uh, for prediction and, and explanation that the macro scale is in fact screened off from the micro mm -hmm. meaning it's not that it's, so it's still caused by the micro but it's not the causation is largely at the macro scale the the, the, the summary statistics the coarse grained variables at the macro scale are sufficient mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Jessica. Um, so yeah, we'll see you later on in the panel discussion. Um, 